scripture reading today is in Hebrews 1, 1 through 3. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir over all things, and through whom he made the universe. The Son is the radiance of God's glory and excellent rep representation of his being, <clears throat> sustaining all things by his powerful word, after he had provided purification of, for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. So be it. Good morning. If you'll bow your heads with me, we'll start in prayer. Father in heaven, we do thank you for the freedom to come and worship you today. May you fill our hearts and minds with your spirit as we search your word, Lord, to find the truths that you would have us apply to, your, to our lives. We thank you for what Jesus did. We thank you for his words, for his example. We thank you that he was 100% man so that he could fill our pain and suffering and that he could 100% take our place on the cross. We just thank you and praise you, Lord, for it's in Jesus' name we do pray and come to you. Amen. So I confused Merle today with the scripture in Hebrews. He said, so are we in Hebrews or are we in John? I said, we're in John. <laughs> so we're going to continue on and understand a little bit about the scripture that we've been reading. But I entitled this message, The Voice. Are you familiar what The Voice is? Yeah, most of you probably think on the front cover, that little logo... The, war, the Voice is a four-time Grammy, Emmy Award-winning show where people compete. And you've got Blake Shelton and all the different ones on there. Team Blake, yay. Competing and training and mentoring so that they can be a success in the music industry of this world. But that's not the voice I want to talk to you about today. I want to talk to you about the voice of God, which in this scripture we have uniquely... At this point, God himself spoke out in an answer to his son. But you know, he was talking to his son, but he was talking to us. Because every word that came out of Jesus' mouth, everything that he did was to save us. So Jesus says, this voice from heaven is not for my benefit, but for yours. And that's what we want to look at today. Jesus had cried out, to his father, save me from this hour, question mark, exclamation point, whatever it is. He cried out to the father about the task that was before him. But yet he said, it doesn't matter, not my will, but yours. It was for this very reason that I was born, was to die for the sins of mankind. So father, father, glorify thy name. And then we get to John chapter 12, verse 28, the second part. Then a voice came from heaven. said, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thunders, thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Verse 30, Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now, before we go any further, let's go back to John chapter 11 and set up John chapter 12 again and see what's going on. I'm going to start in John chapter 11, verse 17. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, If you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. 
The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Now see, I don't know what's going on in your life. I don't know where your faith is. I hope and pray that you know Jesus Christ, that you know God the Father, because you have a relationship with Him through believing, having faith that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, that God did exactly what He said He would do and sent His one and only Son to die for us. It wasn't what we thought would have happened. It wasn't what people thought at that time would have happened. They thought when Jesus came that He would save the country of Israel then and set up His kingdom. But He came to die so that you could be set free from the penalty of sin. And not just the penalty of sin, but the power of sin. And that's why we still live now. Why we still live instead of taking to heaven. Been taken to heaven. Jesus died so that we could live victoriously now. And He goes on to say, I won't leave you as orphans. But I will ask the Father and He will send the Spirit. And the Spirit will reside in you. You will be temples of God. Royal priests gathered together to be my hands and feet, to build my church. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. They never will. They haven't. They won't in the future. We can count on that. Our Lord is faithful. And he said, I have glorified my name and I will continue to glorify my name. And when you read the chapter, you think, oh yeah, I, I can see that because God glorified his name in sending Jesus. And, and, and I know that Jesus is going to go to the cross and die for our sins. So he's glorified his name that way. But Jesus said, this is not for my benefit, but yours. So we need to see how that should be applied to our lives. Because Jesus was the teacher, the rabbi that we are to follow the Lord that we're supposed to submit to and worship. And he said, this voice was not for my benefit, but yours. So we go back to Luke chapter 11, and we see that Lazarus had died. Why weren't you here, God? Why weren't you here in my time of trouble? If you would have been here, you could have saved Lazarus from dying. He told his disciples that he only, Lazarus only slept, and they didn't understand it. They didn't understand that once Jesus died on the cross, death would have no sting. That we who believe will live eternally because Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He's the way, the truth, and the life. We looked at those statements of I am statements. This is the I am statement number five. And I told you if you go back and you look at them and read them, this is the last statement that are those Please come to me so that you will believe. Because the next two statements are for those that do believe. That Jesus is the vine and you've got to cling to Him to grow. This is Jesus' last cry before He goes to the cross. Please believe in me. And a tragedy in your life that you think is terrible, that you don't know what's going on, you have no idea because you weren't there when God hung the stars in the sky. I'm going to use to glorify my name, says God. And I will continue to glorify my name in tragedy and sin and everything else. I don't know how you think about it, but when the world asks you, you know, how, how could a loving God... It's so easy to look how a loving God does use evil when you can look back for His glory and for His honor. Now Lazarus hadn't done anything wrong. There was nothing that he deserved. He got sick and he died. And the people that were there were mourning and they said, He was your friend, Jesus. If only you would have been here. But they didn't see the bigger picture. And so many times we go through things in life and we don't understand the bigger picture and we may never understand the bigger picture. But as Hebrew says, we're supposed to walk by faith, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author, the pioneer, the perfecter of our faith. Because He did it. He did exactly what the Father willed for Him to do. The reason that He came to earth to die for your sins. And He said, Father, forgive them and it is finished. Because it was complete on the cross. Paid for once and for all. So that we can sing songs and say that it is well with my soul and have the peace that surpasses all understanding. Now does that mean that it will be well with your soul every single minute? No, but then you have to turn to fix your eyes on Jesus again and it will be well with your soul. You might not have all the answers, 
but you can find peace in knowing that Jesus faced more than we'll ever face in this life so that we could find comfort in Him, that we could find strength in Him, that we could find life in Him. And if you read this statement he made to her, he said, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. Does he mean just eternally? Or does he mean that they'll live life abundantly as he goes on to say? Because in verse 26 he says, and whoever lives, oh, that's now, that's not later. Whoever lives this life by believing in me will never die. Those are the ones who are saved. Ah, where James can say, hey, show me your faith without works because I, I can't see that. Because if you really believe, you will really live this life to bring glory and honor to God so that even when you're sweating drops of blood, even when your friends have forsaken you and everything, when you know the cross lies before you and you say, Father, save me from this hour, you can then go and say, glorify their name, thy name, whatever it takes, whatever I'm called to do. Because he's answered you and said, I have glorified my name and I will glorify my name. And he meant in you as much as he ever meant in Jesus because Jesus is clear. These words were for you. But there's mourning because we have pain and suffering in this world and it was never intended by God, but we sinned and tainted His creation. In the beginning, God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden. There was no sickness. There was no death. There was no shame. He created us to be in that type of relationship with Him. But we sinned and we caused the downfall. And there's consequences we have to live with. But there is coming a time when every tear will be wiped away. Where we don't have to worry about anything. And we know that no matter what happens in this world, that God is faithful and just. He is in control of all things. There's not random chance. He's in control. Do we know His purpose and design? No, we don't. Peter wanted to stop Jesus from going to the cross because he didn't want his Messiah to die. But see, God's so much bigger than that. He's bigger than anything you can comprehend. He is God. He's the one that hung the stars in the sky. And you know how many stars there are as we learn more and more about that? Billions of billions of stars and billions of billions of galaxies. I cannot even think about comprehending. I was pretty good in math growing up, but not that kind of math to think of those numbers. And he spoke and he created the stars. This vast amount of stars that have power beyond what we can even imagine. And he holds them all in the palm of his hand. He can comfort and take care of your needs. You may not see the bigger picture, so you'll need to focus and keep your eyes on Jesus and find comfort in him that he faced all these things so that you could overcome. So he said, I am the resurrection and the life. What that's saying is you don't have anything to fear. Do you believe me? The theme throughout John, do you believe this? Because if you believe this, mourn, that's fine. We're going to see that Jesus wept. But then give it to God and let Him take it from you. Give it to Jesus because His yoke is light and easy to bear. You may not think it is, but once you give it to Him, you'll be like, oh, the peace that I have that others can never know that don't know you. The power that I have that others will never experience, but I can experience it if I'm willing to deny myself and take up my cross and follow after you. Because God's Spirit resides in me for that very purpose. So live a life that brings glory and honor to God. So Martha's answer in verse 27, Yes, Lord, she replied, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the promised one, the one who will take away the sins of the earth. I believe that you've come in the world. I don't understand what's going on and I'm certainly not going to understand it in John chapter 12 because I don't understand it here in John chapter 11. My brother died. And if you would have been here, you could have done something about it. But because you say, I am the resurrection and the life and I believe that you are God's son, 
the promised anointed one of God that will save the people from their sins, I believe. So then he tells her to go away and get married. You don't see that in the scripture unless you read it good. But when she comes back to Mary, she says the teacher's asking for you. So Jesus called her to faith. Do you believe? Now go do this for me. Go get Mary. So continuing on in verse 28, it says, After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here. I don't think it's coincidence that John uses the word teacher for Jesus. He uses several words. Here he's saying that Jesus is trying to teach us something still. He's not done with his teaching. And is asking for you. There we go. There's where we get that we know that Martha was instructed to go back and ask Mary to come to him also. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had yet not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet. She said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Verse 33, when Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and trouble. Now, I don't know if you've noticed anything from Scripture yet or not, and I've preached about Lazarus before, and I've read these verses many times. But the Word of God is living, and you, if you're looking, He's always going to give you something to feed on, that nugget, that nourishment for your soul, whatever you need at this time. Verse 19 said, And many Jews had come to comfort them in the loss of their brother. Verse 31 says, When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house comforting her noticed how quickly she got up and went, they followed her. Verse 33 says, When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping. Ooh, I can see a little bit bigger part of the story now. Those Jews would have never been there had Lazarus not died. Oh, there is a bigger picture. I didn't see that at all. Jesus was trying to reach Israel with the gospel message. And it's evident that he goes on to reach the whole world. He's told his disciples at the beginning of this, this is for you to learn from. So I'd seen that before. Oh yeah, okay, I see he's teaching his disciples. I can see that he's teaching... Mary and Martha here. But I totally missed the whole time that three different times it said the Jews were there. They came there to comfort. The Jews here represent those who don't believe because the nation as a whole rejected their Messiah and crucified Him. And they would have never, ever been here in this situation if Lazarus wouldn't have died. If Jesus had given just healing... Oh, we would have seen the healing, and that's, that's fine and dandy. But this terrible tragedy of him dying brought them together so that Jesus could see someone raise someone from the dead. So that when he himself went to the cross and was raised from the dead, they would say, hey. So that Lazarus would be the guy in John chapter 12 when they're giving the party for Jesus, the dinner in his honor, and there was Lazarus sitting there at the table also saying, hey, I was dead, remember me? I was dead, but now I live. And the Pharisees went on to the point and said, you know, we've got to kill this Lazarus fella too. Or before long, the whole world will believe in Jesus. There's bigger things out there that we have no idea when we suffer. And if we can use that to bring glory and honor to God, then we're crying out just like Jesus did and said, Not my will, but thine, Father. Glorify thy name. And his answer back, if this is not one of the key verses in, in your memory, it should be. I have glorified my name and I will continue to glorify my name. Because anything that you ever face in life, if you'll pull back on that scripture, you'll know that God is sovereign, that God loves you. Apply that right there with John 3.16.
Because you know that God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes. And since I believe that, I know that God glorifies His name in everything. He always has. He always will. And then I will spend eternity with Him as His child, an heir to God Almighty, who is perfect, who is sovereign, who is faithful, who is just. Do I understand everything? Nope. So I have to walk by faith, not by sight. I have to fix my eyes on Jesus. Look at His words and His teachings so that I can make it through. Now if you notice in verse 27, it says, Now my soul is troubled. Excuse me. Verse 33, it said, Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her weeping and was deeply moved in His spirit and troubled. If you don't remember that, John 12, 27 says, My soul is troubled and what shall I say? Same word in John chapter 11. Because Jesus saw Mary weeping, and not just Mary weeping, but the Jews who did not believe, they are also the enemies of the cross at this point. It troubled him. The same troubling that was before him with the fate that he suffered of death. Not just death, but ridicule and shame and, and torment but because he saw the lost sheep, because he saw his sheep that were hurt in mourning, it troubled his very soul. So he said, I am the resurrection and the life. Draw on this so you don't have to worry. Paraphrasing, he says, the one who believes, it, believes this of me, they will live, they will live forever, even after death. So don't fear death. Don't fear the troubles in this life. For there is victory in the cross. Not foolishness, but the power of salvation, the power to live your life. In fact, death has no sting, has no power over you. The prince of this world has been driven out. The true king has come. That, it er that the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess. And whoever lives this new life by the Spirit, whoever's born again and believes in me, they will never die but have everlasting life. Do you believe this? Don't fear. Don't mourn. I paid the price once and for all on the cross for you. Back to John chapter 11 and verse 33. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved and troubled in spirit. So verse 34, where have you laid him? He didn't say, hey, let me comfort you or anything. He just went to the point. Where have you laid him? Let's go see. What is this Jesus going to do? We don't understand. One of the um, authors in the book that we're going over in Sunday school says that your life by the Spirit shouldn't be, and I'm probably butchering it, <laughs> but shouldn't be you know, led by the Spirit because the Spirit is, is compared to this mighty wind and tongues of fire. It should be you're so blown around that you don't know what's going on but you're just willing to be blown everywhere and see what God does and you're along for the ride. We don't have to know everything step by step. We just have to die so that we can live, so that a harvest can be produced, so God's will is done, so that He will glorify His name and continue to glorify His name. And we just have the privilege of being able to go through that with Him. In the good times and the bad times, even when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil because I know my God is will me, with me, won't forsake me. I know that He'll bring glory and honor to His name. And I know as His child that I have a home in heaven for all eternity. So let me be prepared to tell of that hope when I am given the chance to do that. Where have you laid Him? And here's Mary's response. Come and see, Lord. Not what are you going to do, nothing else. Come and see. Oh, that's not Mary's response, is it? What does your Bible say? They replied. I don't care which translation you have, it says they. 
The Jews replied also, the ones who didn't believe that are going to see this miracle so that they may believe. They replied even, come and see. What are you going to do, Jesus? We don't know. If you're the resurrection and life, show me. And we can look back in our lives and see some of those things, some of those things we can't see. But we need to walk by faith. Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews also weeping. They would have never, ever been there if there hadn't been a calamity. He was deeply moved in his spirit and troubled for all. Because he loves each and every one of you. He had compassion for all, even his enemies. So what's the next verse? Shortest one in the Bible, what is it? Jesus wept. Because he saw their pain and suffering which drove him to John chapter 12 to lay down his life for each and every one, including his enemies. Because that's the very reason that he came, because that's the very reason that God sent him, because that's the God that we serve, that he would sacrifice his one and only son to save every person. So when we contemplate and theorize and can't understand what's going on, he knows exactly what he's doing. And he loves every one of you, no matter what pain and suffering you have in your life. Verse 36 says, Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, just like we see in John 12, some of them said, that was thunder, that was an angel. Not everyone's going to believe. And you don't know, so you have to witness to every one of them and put the saving them to God again. You need to be the hands and feet. You need to be the messenger. You need to tell of the joy that's inside of you. Some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? <laughs> what shallow perception of God Almighty. The one who breathed life, who made everything out of nothing. Could he not stop this man from dying? Well, of course he can. And he can raise him from the dead. But if we hadn't saw that miracle, then even more people would say, Oh, Jesus didn't really die on that cross if they saw him. Or this is a plot or a ploy. But we know through this miracle, through this tragedy that Jesus was able to raise someone from the dead, that He is that Messiah, so that when He goes and dies on the cross and His followers that He's trained up continue to, to teach this gospel message, continue the works of Jesus, that they can say, hey, maybe there is truth to Jesus raising from the dead. Let's go find out if there's anybody in that tomb. And there's not. One of the coolest things about when we went to Israel is in that tomb on the back side of that door, it says, He's not here. He is risen. Everybody that goes in that tomb, sightseeing that, sees that and sees that statement there. Jesus Christ in here. There's no body here. There's no remains. He died and rose again so that you can have life now and forevermore. So how does Jesus respond to their unbelief? Does He criticize them? Or does, what does He do? He, com he responds with even more compassion and tears. Verse 38, Jesus once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave, a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, He said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor. And I love the King James Version here. He stinketh. I'll always say that. He stinketh. I just find that. It's like John was a good old boy from the south, right? Y'all come over here and see this man stinketh. Did I do that all right? <laughs> For he has been here four days. Then... As a response to her unbelief, I'll add that in there. Jesus said, didn't I tell you, didn't I say listen up, verily, verily, those that have ears, let them hear. 
that if you believe, you will see the glory of God. Whoa, we're right to John 12. Where Jesus says, glorify thy name. And the answer, the voice, not the TV show, but the voice from heaven says, I have glorified my name and I will glorify my name. Oh yeah, we can see it in Jesus, but Jesus says, those words were for you, not me. So think about that, apply that to your life. Do you believe in Him? Will you let Him give you peace? Will you let Him be sovereign and be God? Not try to figure out all the answers, but just live by faith? Just absorb that love that God has given you through, this, through His Son. Let it heal all those wounds. You were never created to experience the things that you experience in life. You were never created to have to deal with the sin and the shame. That's not how God created us. We sinned, and we have the result of that. But God loved us so much that He sent His one and only Son to die for us, that whoever believes in Him will be saved, will have everlasting eternal life. Wow. What a loving God we have rather than a God who is a random chance or doesn't care, doesn't see my pain and suffering. Oh, He does. And He wants to end it for all eternity. Don't ever forget that. He will glorify His name and He will continue to glorify His name. So when I was... Getting the sermon ready, it reminded me of some lyrics from a song by Mercy Me. And Bart wrote these words. If you saw the Mercy Me movie, we went to see it as a church. And I believe it's out on video now or coming out any day. Um, I think Mountain Springs is even going to have a movie night of it coming up when it is. If not, this Friday? This Friday. Huh. Coincidence. <laughs> and anyway, the song that these lyrics are from is kind of what brought him to this point. If he hadn't had a dad in his life that was abusive, that might not have drove him to where he's at today. I don't know. He's, these are his words in his song, and he's got a testimony about it. But he praises God for that suffering. If you... Ask Joni Erickson. Joni Erickson says, I'm so glad I'm in a wheelchair because if I wasn't, I would have probably not let God use me unless He brought me down to this level so that I could be used. But the lyrics of this song go like this. Dear younger me, where do I start? If I could tell you everything that I have learned so far, then, then you could be one step ahead of all the painful memories still running through my head. I wonder how much different things would be, dear younger me. Dear younger me, I cannot decide, do I give some speech about how to get the most out of your life? Or do I go deep and try to change the choices that you'll make because they're the choices that made me? Hmm. Even though I love this crazy life, sometimes I wish it was a smoother ride, dear younger me. Even if I knew what I know now, condemnation would have had no power. My joy, my pain would have never been my worth. If I knew then what I know now, wouldn't, would have not <clears throat> been hard to figure out what I would have changed if I had heard. Dear younger me, it's not your fault. Sometimes we carry that burden around. You were never meant to carry this beyond the cross. Because see, that's where it all ends. That's where it was finished. That's where Jesus died for everything that is troubling you, whatever it may be. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 to 30 says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Lazarus' death, John chapter 11, sets up John chapter 12. 
so that we can see Jesus is troubling in His Spirit again because He troubled in His Spirit because people are going to die and not come to salvation. But He was troubled in His Spirit with what lay before Him at the cross. And He said, Glorify Thy name, Father. That's all that matters. Glorify Thy name. And then a voice came from heaven one of three times. We might talk about that more. And it came for our benefit rather than for Jesus' consolation. That voice was, I will glorify it. I have glorified it. And I will continue to glorify it. And that's through your life, through your faith, through your belief. Hard to see it at the times. You may never see it. But remember that verse. Apply it to your life. Remember that Jesus wants to take your burden, your shame, your sins, your tragedies, your unbelief even, and make it all right as long as you'll choose to come to Him. Father in heaven, we do thank you so much that you are perfect in every way that you love us, that you are in control of all things. Even when we think things are out of control, you have an exact plan that will bring you glory and honor. And you will always bring yourself glory and honor. And Father, as your children, I just cannot comprehend that at all. As your child, I know as a father how much love and compassion I have for my own child. And how much more you have. How perfect are your ways. Draw us to you, Lord. Comfort us. Heal us. And thank you for sending your Son to save us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.